Welcome, Northeastern tree fruit workers. Listen in while experts discuss what's on their minds this week, the final week of May 2021. Well, this season has lurched forward temperature wise, and we are in the thick of lots of things primary apple scab season, fire blight, blossom blight season. We are making thinning decisions. We are protecting trees from plum curculio oviposition. It does sound like many regions saw an extended bloom period, particularly for gala and several cider varieties. So we're seeing a little bit of within block variability as far as phenological growth stages. We're starting to see a few signs of poor pollination here and there, but most folks made it through some cold temperatures pretty well. We're seeing a few potential effects of drought conditions from last year, including reports of gypsy moth in many orchards. Normal cover sprays should cover you for young gypsy moth larvae, um, but this should be something folks have their eye out for because mature gypsy moth larvae are a bit harder to control if nature doesn't have her way with these outbreaks. Stick around for a longer conversation there. Looking forward to San Jose scale season. Now would be a good time to take stock of where there were outbreaks in the orchard last year and where crawlers should be targeted this June. Stick around for a little bit of discussion about materials. So this week, everything is happening, um, to put it to put it quite plainly. Um, we're at Petal Fall, just about up here in the Champlain Valley. So we're trying to get thinning applications on. We've got a huge scab infection coming over the weekend. This looks like it's going to be our first... I mean, probably our second big one, but, um, you know, at this point, our discharge has been like 25% for the entire season. And, and we're supposed to, on Saturday, it's supposed to be like 36% discharge and then another 20 on Sunday. So apparently this is like our, our big scab infection. So that starts tomorrow. On top of that, we're in three solid days of fire blade infection period. So uh, we've got that going on too. So I think I, I, I caught the beginning of, or the end of some of your conversation where it was just, you know, what 10 things can I put into my, my spray tank this week? And that's pretty much where we're at. It's just picking and choosing what spray you're going to get on between the insects, the diseases, the thinning, the nutrients, hey, but, everything but I have, else. I have a question for you because like, remember when we first started uh, talking about what we wanted to accomplish here and we're like, I want an answer to what do I do if I have three fire blight infections back to back and when do I spray strep? And like we talked about it for like straight two hours over the winter. Do you feel like you have an answer to that question? So what I've been telling people and anyone else, feel free to to stop me. Um, But my understanding is from our conversations, um, strep has about a 24 hour kickback and protects for, depending on the temperature and weather conditions that you have, probably about 48 hours after the, the application. So what I've been recommending, and it's, it's more feasible for smaller orchards, I think. It's you know, obviously a lot more difficult where you have 700 acres to cover up, but if you really wanna get the bulk out of your application, maybe wait till that first infection actually happens with whatever wedding event that is. And then within 24 hours of the start of that, go in with your strep. So that way you're getting that kickback, but you're also able to take full advantage of that, that 48 hours after the fact too. And then within, after that 48 hours, if you have more infections coming, probably need more strep. Heather, feel free to stop me if I'm or consume it. If you got other you ideas follow. If you want to follow Carrick's resistance management strategies. Yeah, switching to a different product at that point. Luckily, with our survey from last year, it looks like we didn't have any resistant populations of fire blade up in the Champlain Valley. We'd obviously like to keep it that way. Um, but certainly, we've got a stretch where it's just like three, four days plus of, of infection events. And then there's there's been the question of, well, how much dew is enough dew? And is my spray application really going to do it? But we've really been telling people, yeah, it it certainly can. So what are the, what are the rotational materials again? So if you, if you are wanting to keep strep as a healthy, you mentioned 
Janet, what just missed? I think it's just strep and kasumin or kasugamycin. I, as far as I know, those are the only two like really solid. You know, there's all the like kind of random blossom protect and um, what's the uh, regalia and things like that that are like probably not as surefire. Safe. So it sounds like the other ones are like something you would have to apply earlier to mm -hmm. bolster the, or how, what, how do they work? Regalia is that like a in systemic resistance inducer or whatever they're called. Okay. Um, Blossom Protect, I think, is that the one, Mike? I forget. I think that's the one that um, is another bacteria that competes, outcompetes, supposedly. Yeah, I think so that's another Bacillus it. product. Yeah, so you would supposedly you defy it like at the same timing, kind of as strep or just slightly before, <clears throat> but it's not the same effectiveness at all. So I, you know, I don't really recommend it, to be honest unless a grower asks me about it. Is there any place for it at this point? Organic. And people are using that? Are they, is it, does that I mean talk about frequent application, right? Would that have to be applied a lot? Um, Cause it's a, it's a competitor, like does it come off of rain? I think you would reapply it like the same amount that you would reapply strep. Okay. Um, from, I mean, this is just me saying what I've heard Carrick say, so <laughs> I don't, I assume that that's correct. I, to be honest, I don't even know if the organic growers are using it necessarily. I think some of them are just hoping, fingers crossed, hope for the best type thing. Print it out later. Yeah. I'm sorry that I've been Apogee. rude here though. So what product <laughs> are you talking about? Oh, no problem, Heather. It's a, I'm sure it's a, a phone call kind of day. <laughs> so we're talking about Blossom Protect right now. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. So the, the and I flubbed it's uh it's an Ario Basidium. That's the Excellent. organism in that one. <clears throat> this is this is something I'm very I'm very paying much attention to though, because it's a bio competitor, right? And we did talk to Carrick a little bit about that. And the, the work that he has done so far is that from an efficacy point of view, absolutely something to take seriously. From a cost point of view, I don't know if it really works into IPM programs. Is that mm. a good takeaway from what you've heard from Carrie? I think what I thought I've heard is that from an efficacy standpoint, when it works, it's really effective and as good as strap, but it's not as surefire because it's more it's even more specific in terms of like timing and yeah. conditions that you get it on at the right the exact right moment so 60 percent of the time it works every time right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> and i think it's it's one of those where if it's a low fire blight year it's better than nothing at all obviously but in a bad year compared to strep it's you know it's not going to give you nearly the same amount of control and if all of your blossoms opened at the same time. Right, right. So that brings me to what I was going to say. So do you guys have organic cider producers with these cider varieties that bloom over a five-week period? Or, you know, I, I guess it's Dabinette. I was just talking to a grower yesterday who has fruit set and bloom and, you know, more buds coming along. And it's, ah, as John Clement says, it's just like, you know, forget this. Forget the cider varieties. They're just going to all die of fire blight. Anyway, I wonder if, if you guys are dealing with mm -hmm. organic cider producers. And also, though, on that note, I don't know if this is everywhere, but I've been seeing gala blocks that are like that. Like gala blocks where there is fruit set and pink both on the exact same tree. Yeah. Is that I think with how normal? delayed and extended bloom was this year, I mean, gala on like that first year would or that one-year-old would, you know, they'll, they'll have those flowers opening much later. And I noticed that, I know it's not as relevant to the, the group here, but Snapdragon is another one of those where mm -hmm. we're definitely mm -hmm. seeing things that are setting for them, still have, mm -hmm. still have buds hanging out at pink. And I wonder mm -hmm. if they're, if they're, they've got some type of disease or something that's, that's causing some of those clusters to not open up or mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like a powdery mildew inside the cluster or this actually brings up a question that I have about like this time of year where we're hearing, 
we're hearing folks say that like like they have poor poor maybe maybe poor pollination in their king blossoms because for us we're we're just at the tail end, tail end of bloom right now so like we're starting to see maybe the kings didn't either like it was too cold or like they didn't get good pollination like what are some other things physiologically or disease wise that that we'd be starting to encounter now yeah, so I think for us, the big thing that we saw was we did have a, a cold event that definitely took some things out. And just anecdotally, I think, you know, there's so many different ways that that can affect things. It could like kill the flower outright and it just stops developing. You can lose the style. So the flower will still look okay. But when you look more closely at the style, that's that's burnt back. Then I've also seen where I think the flowers can still look okay, but um, certainly this year we're seeing some that are just really short and we're still not sure if they're actually going to set or not. So um, even though you cut into it and everything still looks green, it's hard to say if they're going to, they're going to stay, stay on. So I think there's some like sublethal dose of, of cold that, that can affect things too, that we might not be able to necessarily see outright, but that's just, my sort of thoughts on it. I don't have anything to back that up with. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those really, really broad window of flowering, it's, it's a nightmare for fire blight, but at least you have a little bit of diversity as far as like flowers that set fruit during, you know, a diversity of temperatures, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> right, yeah. And our event, our cold was back in sort of the, that weird spot between half inch green and tight cluster. So, I mean, we have, we evaluated a lot of the blocks at that point, and I was seeing probably 15% king damage in our honey crisp. Uh, a lot of the laterals were looking, looking okay though. So we made adjustments for that going into thinning season. Um, but again, I, I think even if they weren't necessarily dead, there could be some that are, are still just weak. So it, it'll be interesting to see if they, they stay on. Because I think if they're stressed and when you get into like the carbohydrate balance and looking at the PGR thinners and everything, um, I think if they're already slightly more stressed, you're more likely to take them off with your thinner too. So certainly a, a lot of interesting variables this year for uh, our thinning sprays. <laughs> Janet, what's going on in your neck of the woods? <clears throat> yeah, so we're sort of around petal fall in most varieties-ish. We also have a big, our big fire blight event has happened this week. Um, and similarly, it was sort of like three to five days straight of high infection events. So we tried to kind of recommend that they time ahead of the beginning of the event and then probably ended up putting on another one about three days later. The other disease, I think we're mostly done with scab. We're sort of at the point where the new model says that we're 100% ask us for discharge. But then if you talk to people, they say that's probably overestimating. So, so this is sort of that tricky stage where I don't know whether I should recommend people to keep covered for scab, but they probably will anyways. And then powdery mildew, you know, once the temperatures warmed up here in the last week, um, there's a couple sites I've gone to that are just like entire blocks. Every single tree has powdery mildew. Um, those are hot spots that they the grower knew that there was a high pressure, but uh, I was surprised how quick because you know I go to the same sites. This is on my trap line, so I go every week, and there was nothing there last week, and now it's just like every tree. Um, so I think it's just the conditions suddenly were perfect and it exploded. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing everybody's doing is that petal fall insect spray. So, um, plum curculio, of course, is the big one. And then every, oh, gypsy moths we've seen, I don't know if that's across the whole region or if that's just here, but, um, almost every orchard I've been in has gypsy moths, uh, maybe like second in star. So I've been recommending people get something like a dye pal in their spray for that. We're seeing a ton of those gypsy moths up here too. For whatever reason, they're just exploding around the state this year. Apparently, I keep getting photos every day of them. Okay, yeah, I've heard that um, it's a combination. I don't know why this is, but I've heard that it's a combination of just like the natural cycle of gypsy moth that it's an upper edge of it, and then for some reason the drought last year has boomed the population. I don't know why the drought would make the population higher, but that's okay. I don't remember if that was art or somebody like that that told me that. 
the entomophaga fungus that doesn't, that's what usually controls the population of gypsy moths. And when you have a drought, especially the second half of May and into June, then you just have, you can have explosions of gypsy moths. I appreciate it. I've been actually trying to figure that out in my head for the past, like every time I tell somebody that, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. This is what I've heard. It was a good, reliable source. It doesn't make sense. Yes, so I really it. appreciate it. Okay. And then also I, I wanted to say that if you're, you've got second instar gypsy moths and they're putting on petal fall sprays, I don't think they need, with an insecticide, I don't think they need an extra dipel. Um, I think that whatever they're putting on uh, for or petal fall uh, insecticide would kill gypsy moths. I mean, unless it's surround or something like that. Uh, I would agree with I, that 100%. Okay, I yeah. just would recommend Dipel, like if they want to spray gypsy moths during bloom, which which often which often happens. That's that's when they're blowing into the orchard. So that's when I'll recommend Dipel. So would basically, I mean, something that doesn't have any effect on laps wouldn't work. Like when I look at the list of of Plumcurculio, there's some that also have coddling moth control and some that don't. So basically if they use one that also controls coddling moth, it would also control gypsy moth. Is that but so like imidan, it's just they're pretty but they're right. pretty susceptible when they're second in stars. They're still small. You know, when they get to be big caterpillars, then you need something that's really good for laps. But as when they're small caterpillars, I think anything would kill them. I, I don't know what wouldn't kill them. Kathleen, do you have a feeling that that so those anything that would work for Plumker Coolio, I think, would control gypsy moths second. In yeah, time. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, they they're really sensitive to insecticides, and and we don't, you know, back when they were a severe problem here in in Massachusetts, they just they weren't an orchard problem because people were, you know, were were spraying anyway. So you know, they're only they've got one generation a year. They only encounter pesticides occasionally, so they just they don't have any, you know. No but, resistance to anything. But then I have had orchards that are surrounded by woods and they're keeping the orchard clean and then you get a march of caterpillars. But and then, and then those are big caterpillars and then you need something, you know, Altacor or something that's really good against gypsy moths. Would what other products, because I know they also say Dipel doesn't really work once they're past second or third generation. So aside from like the Altacor Xerils, is there seven? Would that be? Uh, like delegate, I think did pretty well. Like Imidan did not do well against big caterpillars. I mean, you you hopefully don't need to spray against big caterpillars because that's you've got a huge, you know, forest defoliation population if you, you, you need to spray. So you really shouldn't. They shouldn't need to spray. But um, yeah, it's the intrepid. I don't remember. Do you remember Kathleen? What whether no? Like I said, we've never you know really kind of specifically tried to control gypsy moths. Um, so yeah, we usually hit them. Um, I mean, we, what was it? A couple of within the last couple of years, we've had a few outbreaks like that. Um, and this year, they're a little behind the tree development. So you know, we're mm. definitely tiny little things. But you know, people were hitting them with their normal petal fall spray a couple of years ago, and they must have been. <laughs> excuse me, third or fourth in, in star at that point. Um, and it seemed like everything worked at that point. But like you said, if you get into, you know, fifth, sixth in star, yeah. I you need know, to squish them. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Um, can, I, can, I, can I try a bit of a summary? Because <laughs> like I'm hearing lots of things, but like um, they're kind of confusing me. So we're talking about the fact that without a healthy epizootic going on, you have some little babies coming in. And this is very common and it's happening. You're seeing this happening all over the place. And um, the epizootic doesn't usually happen until their fifth instars or so. Okay, okay, okay. So, so if, if we continue to see the dry conditions that we're seeing, because like, I, I think it's quite dry here where I am. I don't, I don't know if everybody else is seeing that. Like it's so dry that it's kind of like, our apple scab ascospores are kind of being delayed a little bit, you know, like, which is like, that's how dry it is. But I thought my, my impression, sorry to jump in. I thought my impression was that it was last summer when they were at that like fourth or fifth in star stage was when the drought was last year. It could be both. And for that reason, for that reason, there were more than normal turned into adults. You know, and if you like walked around last winter, I know I would just see like gypsy moth 
egg masses all over the trees. Um, and so I think for that reason, we have more caterpillars this year because of last year's lack of uh, epizootic. Sorry, I didn't mean to, I just wanted to clarify right, that. Right, right, and that's perfectly, that's perfectly right. But, but then when they will die this year, unless you have a really wet spring, when these caterpillars will dry, die this year is gonna be mostly when they're large caterpillars. So you still get the little ones that are around and unless it's really wet. So um, anyway, go on summarizing it. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it sounds like we have drought conditions last year and we we're going to have drought conditions this year. So the, the population was like unnaturally high last year coming into this year. And it sounds like nature is not going to necessarily take its course unless we have a bit more moisture. And like, that sounds like what you're saying, right, Heather? Yeah. But in, in, a, in a traditional orchard, um, do you think that a thinning, so say we're in a situation because we've had this long drawn out situation where we were talking about this last week where your petal fall spray might be somewhat separated from your Kirk spray, your PC spray, because like sometimes they line up really well because like you have your fruit developing really quickly. Sometimes, you know, those fruitlets that are susceptible to plum curculio take a little bit while, take a little while to develop. So say you, you go in with petal fall and you're using carbaryl for thinning with that would that control tiny little gypsy moths? We're thinking they're so sensitive when they're little. Yes. Then any material that you would target for Kirk is gonna also get gypsy moth larvae. In really, really rare situations where you have an outbreak population of gypsy moth when they're big, we're still on, there's probably not a lot of evidence as far as controlling that, but there might be intrepid altacore. That might be a reason to break out altacore if you have like that really oddball scenario where you have late instar gypsy moth. Is that a good summary? Yeah, that sounds, sounds perfect. Good. Can, I, can I keep the gypsy moth conversation going for one more question? I love talking about gypsy moths. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I found somebody who knows the answers to these things. So I've seen them in apples. I've seen them in blueberries, which I know they're, they really like blueberries. I've gotten some questions from grape growers who have seen them but have questions of whether it's worth spraying. And I don't think the grapes are putting on, you know, they, they don't have a petal fall spray. And so some of the grape growers have been asking me, like, should I be spraying for these? Or is it just something that won't, do they like grapes? I think is my question. Or do you have I any I seem data? to re recall, because we had a huge outbreak 2015, 16, 17. And I don't think it was a problem for the grape growers. I really don't think it was a problem at all. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, never, I've never heard of them in, in grapes. I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> but I think I remember, person. yeah, people asking. And you know, I think if they did bother grapes, I think we would know about it. So how's that for a silly yeah, reason? I think that, that sounds like a reasonable answer. Yeah. I also have a bit of a bias towards East Coast grapes, like vigor is more of a problem here, you know, <laughs> like losing defoliation in grapes before horizon is like, mm, cool your jets. <laughs> Benefit, <laughs> doing a little leaf pruning for you. Right. So Heather, what's going on where you are? Well, I have not been in an orchard. Maybe I was in one Monday. Anyway, I have not been in an orchard all week, so I don't know. And I yeah, I'm not, anyway, I'm gonna be in an orchard this afternoon. Um, anyway, I think, I think they're doing okay. I think um, we started bloom early enough. And so yes, it was extended, but we were pretty much at petal fall everywhere when we started getting this hot weather. And so I'm hopefully not too worried about uh, fire blight except with my cider growers. Um, and yeah. That, that yeah, just have these varieties that haven't come into bloom yet. So but maybe was, it's just a matter of time to get those weeded out of the orchard. You know, these, <laughs> is it the dabinette that blooms like a month later than Macintosh or so? Um, so anyway, I, I just, you know, I'm sure I'm saying a lot for saying I don't know, but. Uh, well, I was laughing because I was really caught off guard. Andy emailed me the other day saying he was sitting outside and a, color, a Colorado potato beetle flew by him. And I was like, how is it warm enough for that to happen? <laughs> He's like, it's 80 degrees here. <laughs> yeah. You know, we were at 82 and it's going to go up 
So the high 70s today, or you must be getting the same weather. And then they're talking Sunday sounds like a perfect Plum Curculio day, like hot and humid. So yeah, it sounds perfect. So I haven't seen any Plum Curculio damage yet, but I haven't looked in any unsprayed trees and I haven't been in orchards either, so. Well, Kathleen yeah. reported some stings. What's going on? What are you seeing, Kathleen? Yeah, so we're seeing a bit of activity. It, it hasn't, I haven't seen anything where there's been extensive uh, Curculio activity. So yeah, they're probably waiting for that, that, you know, humid weather to come up. Um, and I, you know, I did a 180 as far as, you know, talking about that separation between petal fall and, and fruit sizing, uh, because, you know, when the warm weather hit, it's like, okay, bam, everything's happening at once. So, you know, get out there. If you're not spraying strap, spray insecticide. If you're not spraying insecticide, spray strap. <laughs> um, and actually that was, you know, Monday we had some rain. Other than that, it's been, been dry. And then they're looking at more rain for the weekend. So I've got a handful of people that have either very late varieties or are way up in the hills. And those guys are probably going to go on being concerned about fire blight. Uh, but, you know, it, it seems like as the fire blight risk is going like that, the pedal fall is, you know, coming, coming right down. So, you know, most people are okay for that. Uh, but yeah, definitely some Kirk activity. I was just totally caught flat footed by, I mean, I knew it was going to be warm. I knew stuff was going to happen. <laughs> and it was like, after about the third person asked me, so what about mating disruption ties that I kind of went, Oh my God, like yesterday would have been really good. <laughs> So, um, you know, so I, and I did see a few, um, I think it was greater peach tree borers in a, in a trap this week. So, um, they are, you know, um, starting to, starting to fly. Um, and I've seen a few codling moth adults, um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll be looking at mites today down in, in the Hudson Valley and, and see if I see anything down there. But so far, I usually, the guys up here, I kind of I kind of wait until I actually see some indications of mite feeding before I even bother about it. But the, the, the Hudson Valley guys are paranoid, so I'll check them first. <laughs> so, so do you, <laughs> do you really use the, when you catch coddling moth as a biofix for starting the models? Yes. And, because Glenn Kaler is like, you know, ha, I don't know. He, he thinks that you should just go with the, a petal fall date to set the biofix rather than use the. Um... <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, it's probably close enough, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, so, you, but, so you're just catching a couple, you know, you, you've only caught a couple of coddling moths so far and you're they really, I think, I think last week I had just caught a few this week. I've had captures in the kind of five, six, eight, ten area. So, you know, with, if, if there's talking about sustained flight, I guess that would probably come under the definition of the beginning of, of sustained flight. So yeah, it's pretty close to pedal fall. So I don't know. I've not looked at it that, you know, critically and i'm sure you could just guess you know i mean it's like what i do with scales like mid-june yeah go <laughs> <laughs> I ain't looking for no damn crawler <laughs> yeah. I, well I, I, it's the adults i am done with those oh. adult traps I just, <laughs> uh, yeah. well i'm gonna do it this year because i've never done it before and then what with the tape with like the double-sided tape i'm gonna do it and then maybe I'll have done it and then I don't need to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Just be sure was. you get a really active, it's, it's really hard to get the right spot, but yeah, it really needs to be a place where the. I got, I got a couple good spots. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I never was successful with the tape. I just would go and look yeah, in a really good spot, a very good active spot and look for the yellow crawlers because yeah. They're, they're usually easy to see, especially if you have a good infestation. <laughs> Kathleen, do you use the black tape, black sticky tape? For Sometimes, yeah, yeah. And actually some of my growers uh, use it. So that's, that saves me a little trouble, you know, because they really know their, you know, their spots. Um, and so we can go and look, you know, look together and, and see what we see. Uh, but they're often more on top of it than I am. And you find the tape helpful? The yeah. Black sticky tape? Yeah. yeah. So in identifying those those hot spots, Kathleen, like what's what's typically the trigger? Like a certain percentage of fruit infestation, or like if they see any 
any anything on fruit, they'll they'll kind of flag that area as a problem area. How do they make decisions? Yeah, the, I think the the fruit injury, and then you know just look for you know look for them on the bark and and stuff because they're they're pretty visible when they when they get to be a, a good population. It's hard when you're just first starting to see you know fruit injury. It can be kind of a at least to me, it's it's a pretty subtle thing, and I don't I often don't get the right right spot. But if you can find a you know real pimply <laughs> little area, <laughs> then, yeah, do you think that Heather would you say the same? Yeah, and then also kind of pick at the scabs and you know make sure that they're viable. You see the yellow uh, you know females under there to see that they're actually alive because sometimes you'll see old infestations and it's. You know, the, Anyway, it can look pretty similar. So to make sure it's a live infestation is good. Yeah. And Anna, the, the Comstock mealybugs, I found some some new nymphs the other day. So you had mentioned last week that, that you're seeing those up in New Hampshire. Yeah, we have a couple spots that have resident populations for sure. Um, and I think the, the folks who invested in Movento last year got pretty good control, um, especially considering I think that I, the conditions were ideal for mealybug outbreaks last year summer so the only spots that that they stayed were really like the big trees where they couldn't get the coverage they needed to, to control those little tiny bugs but like what are, what are your recommendations as far as materials for bugs in general well for for, for the, i mean i've only got one guy that that has a problem and he's kind of we're, we're uh we contacted art and yellow and and Art made a dent where I couldn't in getting to stop using pyrethroids <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> so, so we're really, you know, that was the big thing to back off that. Um, and he's used Movento and he's used, um, oh, I can't think what else. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is using a sail as a petal fall spray and figuring that'll have a little bit of effect since the nymphs are just starting to pop out that maybe that a sale will help to suppress them. Um, and then we'll just scout, you know, for the further activity. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm not sure what the, what the next phase will be. I, 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 the Movento is so insanely expensive that, <laughs> yeah. And there was one year that he did it twice. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they're, they're still not gone. I mean, they're definitely suppressed, but they're not gone. Yeah. From, from just looking at the spray trials that are being tried in, in scale and in mealybug and, and other, you know, small piercing sucking things, it looks like the industry is really pushing for, like, a Savanto, um, a Savanto Movento rotation. So, like, Savanto is kind of like the new four, new, new IRAC four, but I think that a sale is just as good as far as, like, a rotation material as Movento from mm -hmm. what I've read. Again, I have no real experience with this. So that's why I'm looking for like, what do you actually do in the field? I think I think we can we can wrap up unless anybody has any other questions for each other. Has anybody actually seen any scab <laughs> lesions? Yeah. I haven't really been looking that much though. I mean yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I want to do my little happy dance that we're, you know, <laughs> not seeing anything. But, you know, I'm not, I, I, I heard somebody say that, that the UMass Twilight meeting that they said there was some um, lesions in the, in the unsprayed, you know, the X block that they don't put any um, insecticide or fungicide in. Um, but, and I'd love to know, you know, what leaves and where yeah, we had like an, that, we had an infection period oh, long ago enough that we should be seeing lesions around now in unsprayed blocks. So now we be trying to look at it, I guess. I have an organic block. I have one organic block and one block that is not organic, but they just have so many things going on that they frequently don't time their sprays correctly that I sort of use as my two guinea pigs. I haven't seen scab in either of them yet. But I agree, I should have. So I don't, I don't know if I just have missed it or if it's not there. Oh boy. All right. <laughs> bye bye, bye guys. <laughs>